Nitto Performance Engineering products have powered many of the quickest and fastest RB powered vehicles in the world, including the quickest Outlaw and Pro Street Skyline GTRs, plus an army of True Street 8 second monsters. The parts developed and tested at the top end make their way down into streetcars. Now, 1500 horsepower in a streetcar and 2300 horsepower in a drag RB30 is the new benchmark. But Nitto has been working on bottom end parts that could enable 2000 horsepower streetcars and 3000 horsepower drag cars. We caught up with Jim Suvis to find out more. We never had intentions of our 4340 billet crank to run mid to to low six second passes. It was never designed there. I guess the, the quality of the component attributes to how good it actually is. It, it far succeeded what we ever had planned for it. Since I, I have been actively, deeply involved in the um, pursuit of power in an RB, and I can safely say that with the vehicles I'm, I'm associated with, uh, we have been at the forefront of development so I've been able to see the brick walls. For us, with our off-the-shelf 3.2, um, we were able to get that kit to run up to about 2,000 horsepower at the wheels. The first hurdle was the block. So once we got to the end of the, the cast block's ability, once the concept came, was, was brought to us with a billet block. The cast block, apart from the limitation of its power, we also had limitations in connecting rod size. How the RB30 is designed, it really left us not a lot of space to be able to put a wider rod or a, or a thicker rod in there to some extent to be able to make more horsepower again. So what we found with the billet block, because of the design in the bottom end was opened up a little bit more, we could then look at running uh, an aluminum rod, which really is what was the next step was. So we were looking then to go from 2,000 horsepower, not to go to 2,200, we're looking to go in the steps of 500. So we're gonna go 2,000, okay, what's the next target? Two and a half. Okay, what are we gonna do to, for two and a half? We've got more room in this billet block. Okay, so what's, what's the next move? Okay, aluminum rods. In that side, they were the steps. So we've gone, okay, cast iron block, hit the limit. Okay, next, might as well do rods and pistons. So let's develop a new piston, new rod combo. Okay, we've got that. Ah, oh, the 4340 still coping. All right, there's a little bit of uneven wear on the bearings, but it's not doing anything weird, okay? Uh, no breakage, we've never had an RB32 crank ever in all my years break. So we push the next level. All right, so now we're seeing a little bit of bearing wear. So the next progression after that was to, okay, we've got the ability to go to EN40B. Similar design to what we've already got, a few little tweaks and upgrades. Uh, we tweaked the oil gallery a little bit. We were then able to teardrop it as well. We then ran that in one of our test vehicles, making 2,300 horsepower at the wheels, uh, at the hubs, I should say, with the EN40B crank, our new rods and pistons. You pull it all back apart, everything is absolutely fantastic. Okay, we're looking forward. Me as the head tuner of, of Chun, one of the issues that I found was the big end bearings. It doesn't matter how much oil we, we sent to them, it doesn't matter what we did, they're only a 17 millimeter wide bearing. 50 millimeter is the diameter of the crankshaft journal, so that's pretty decent. But a 17 millimeter bearing to try and make, you know, 400 odd horsepower per cylinder, you, you're asking for a lot. What do we got to do now to go to the next level? Okay, well, for me to stop tuning to the bearings, I've got to come up with another idea. And the other idea was find a wider bearing. We know that the peak the bigger are two J's. What they do is they actually run what they call a Chevy slash Honda bearing, which is uh, goes down from 52 millimeter in diameter of journal. They machine it down to 48 millimeters, but go to about 22 millimeter wide. I ended up sitting down and working out a, a whole new program. I got okay. Well, we're going to redesign a new crankshaft. We're going to focus on getting oil to those journals. We're going to stop having issues with centrifugal force trying to suck oil away from the big ends. We're also going to come up with a bearing that's going to work that's significantly wider. We're going to match that up with a, a new connecting rod piston design, and hence we came up with the current crankshaft we've got now. One of the things I've been focusing on is keeping everything RB. And the biggest question for us was, when is an RB 
not an RB. And for us it was when we can't put this crankshaft into any other RB block. We've been true to form and we've been able to keep everything as, as per original Nissan OEM style. So you can actually take this extreme drag crankshaft and put it into a billet block, an RB30 uh, cast block, an RD28 block, and that's what we call a true RB swap over. We've also been able to maintain integrity on our big end journals by keeping it the 50 millimetres. Um, and what we've done is I've come up with a bearing design which has actually allowed me to go from 17 millimetres wide to 20 and a half millimetres wide as an off the shelf item with the ability to go 22 millimetres wide with the same crankshaft, with the same rods, just a, a custom bearing for anybody that might require that down the line. So we've thought uh, forward, you know, so we, we've actually been proactive. So we've got a crankshaft on the bench here which will actually work up to about 3,000 horsepower. So the whole kit was designed for 3,000 horsepower. Effectively, the, um, from the original bearing to our bearing, there's about 20%. It's actually pretty well spot on 20% or a tad over. So there's a 20% increase on footprint uh, on the bearing. Now, what does that do? So some people that might not sound like much. To some people, the people in the know, they're going, wow, okay, that's a big increase. Why? You're trying to push 500 horsepower through a 17 millimeter bearing. In fact, that's what it is. That's a bit of soft material there. It's, the, it won't take long for the integrity of that bearing to sort of get to the point where it just squashes itself out from horsepower. Not because it wasn't tuned right, not because it didn't get enough oil to it. It's just how much can that little bearing hold? So we've gone, okay, well we know from, from other engine combinations and from what we can see as tuners ourselves that we've got to do something with this bearing to be able to get to the next level. So effectively going from your two and a half thousand horsepower, which we've had with a 17 millimetre bearing, to now the 3,000 horsepower. I wouldn't recommend you run two and a half thousand horsepower with a 17 mil bearing, although we've done it already, and it was quite, it was, it was quite okay. But I couldn't say to you it's going to run, you know, like 50 passes or, you know, and then it's all going to be great. So to be able to then go 500 horsepower a cylinder, we had to come up with a bearing combination that was going to work. We had to also come up with a bearing that's going to be, it's going to be an off the shelf item. Uh, so you can, you'll be able to access that through ACL. We're working on a concept of what's going to work in the drag scene, but we're also making it user and installer friendly. So anybody can take that who knows anything about RBs, put it together, components will be available. And uh, it, as I said, it's not only designed for a billet block, uh, it's designed and will work with anybody that wants to use it in a cast block as well. This has even still got the OEM drive on it. If somebody said, I want this wide journal, and as I've already had some requests from some of the top pro RB workshops, they do want to run the wider journal in some of their builds. Uh, and we're discussing that with them at the moment, and they still want it wet some. We've actually got the drive still on there. If somebody wants to then adapt, say, our sign drive onto it, easy to do. If somebody wants to use the two flats, they're there. Go for gold. And that's what our main purpose was. Uh, we weren't looking at building any Franken-style style thing. We wanted to get something which was going to be Nissan RB true to form. So anybody that's existing with an RB billet block can upgrade to our 3,000 horsepower kit. They don't have to have any special machining done to their blocks or anything like that, it's straight in. If somebody with a cast block, as I said, I've been approached for that by certain workshops and we're in the process of making kits up for them, uh, they can still take that same crankshaft and run it in a, in a street engine with steel rods, which we've actually got already. I've got a set of steel rods here, very similar in design to our current one. Slight changes, so a few upgrades made to that particular rod, and that can quite easily be run in a 1600 horsepower and whatever else, 1500, 1700, 1800 block, without any bearing issues whatsoever. Crankshafts are not all the same. Uh, they might all fit in a similar position, but there are so many little design changes between one manufacturer and one design concept to another. And this particular crankshaft is actually different to the current range of crankshafts that we got. Uh, and why is it different? Okay, so focusing on the 3000 horsepower side, we wanted to minimise how many oil gallery holes were going through the, cr the crankshaft, hence compromising the integrity of the crankshaft itself. 
So we didn't want to turn it into a Swiss cheese. So what we're doing in this setup is we've got a um, specifically timed ore gallery design and we've increased the ore gallery diameter of the, of the original design, our original design crankshaft, by approximately 20%. Uh, so no, not only are we, for example, and I'll just show you, is um, we've got that particular thing can go, that little steel rod can go straight through. So that's why it's affectionately called a straight shot. As we sort of lead towards the back, the crankshaft design starts to change. And how does it change? It actually becomes stronger and wider than the front at the back. And some people have sort of get the gist of what, why, but the ones that don't, let me explain it. Cylinder one, 500 horsepower. Cylinder two is another 500. So it's got 500 and 500. So there's a, there's a thousand going to here. So from here, there's 1,500. From there, there's another 500. That's 2,000. So right here, we're at 2,000 horsepower, okay? So as we're heading towards the back, we're already making more horsepower in a four cylinder that we will, sorry, in four cylinders than we were making before with a 4340, over six cylinders. So as we come back, the design changes here. So we add more material, go wider in the webbing and the journal, uh, wider in the webbing, wider in, in the throws as well to add more material so that it can then hold the additional horsepower. So as we get back to cylinder five, we're basically two and a half thousand horsepower. By the time we get to cylinder six, there's 3,000 horsepower going through this last section. Okay, so we've changed the design quite a fair bit back here to accommodate for the massive increase. You know, 500 might be a figure, but it's actually quite a big figure. And so we weren't overly interested in doing too much with alloy rods at the time, uh, in the initial stage of billet blocks coming out and whatever else. The problem though was, in the process of making more and more power, as we were finding with Jun, for example, um, the rods that we were using were, they were supposed to be lasting for 50 runs. Three sets of rods later, one was lucky to get off the dyno, the other two were lucky to make 20 runs. Basically meant that we hit a brick wall with longevity of alloy rods to the point where we were getting 20 runs, 20, if we get 22 runs, that was it. Motor out, change the rods. And we've gone, man, if these things aren't gonna last at 2,000 horsepower, 2,200, what's gonna happen when we're going for two and a half and three? We have to find something else. Why not design our own rod, forge ahead, and do something which we didn't really wanna do at the time, but we're really forced into it. What we did is we uh, partnered up with Carrillo, I gave them a concept of what I wanted. So then we end up coming with a coming up with a rod, which is our own rod now, good for 500 horsepower cylinder. The weight's pretty respectable when you pair it up with our piston and, and, a, and a, a Trend TP1 gudgeon pin. It's still lighter than our street kit, which is regularly running 10, 10 and a half thousand RPM. So you can imagine these things, what they would do. Well, we found out. So what we ended up doing is we ended up uh, running this setup in Jun, um, and then I were able to tune it on a hub dyno and um, that's where we're able to get the thing to run to 2300 horsepower very easily. We actually ran out of injector. From that I, I was able to, to see what RPM I could go to. This combo with the normal bearing, not the wide crank, with the normal bearing was going to 11,500 RPM every time. N no issues pulled it all apart to have a look at it. Everything was absolutely spot on. Bearings were perfect, uh, balls were perfect, pistons are perfect. You're obviously doing something right. If you, the bearings are right, which are the weakest part of everything, then everything else is right, which means the weight of the piston is correct, the weight of the rod is correct, the bearing is doing a job, the crankshaft's doing its job, um, because the bearing is happy. Uh, and the tune is obviously spot on as well. We do the alloy rod in two versions because we've still got to cater for the guys who want to run that 2000, 2200 with a billet block and still want to run the 17 mil with their original 4340 crankshaft. So we do the 17 mil version and we do the 20 and a half mil version. That is for the guys who just want to go out and go to a drag strip and race. Because we let our, some of our pro dealers in on what was going on, they've gone, hey, that's a great idea. Um, when we tune these as well, we find that we can compromise integrity of the, of the big end bearing. If you're making a crank with a wider journal, well, why don't you design a rod that we can use in the, on the street as well? 
and, uh, and that's what we've actually done. And so the particular rod which I've got here is actually our normal rod uh, with some, some small changes, some more up, some small upgrades, and with the actual 20.5 millimeter uh, bearing, again, which is 20% bigger than the OEM width bearing. 10 years ago, the 1,000 horsepower was the extreme. And I mean, I was, I've been in it from day dot, right? So my history with RBs goes back to 96-ish. So we were the first guys in Australia to be really doing anything with uh, GTRs. The, you know, 14, 15, 600 horsepower is now the norm. Anything, anything decent in an RB32, if it's not making that power, it's not, a, it's not up there with the big boys. They're slowly creeping into the point where they want to have 2,000 horsepower streetcars. Long, I, I don't know what they want to do with it, but it's up to them. You know, the futures uh, <laughs> will show what, what's going to come eventually. Our thing was to be proactive with our components. Our thing was to focus on what we can better do for tomorrow. We've partnered up with um, CP. Um, in uh, providing us pistons to our own design. Uh, it's something we've been very successful at for how many years. So, um, so then it was an obvious choice to then uh, talk with um, CP to be able to come up with a piston that's gonna suit 500 horsepower cylinder. To do that, obviously um, requires a lot of technical knowledge, know-how, um, and also a lot of R&D. When we were getting to the point we were running with a competitor brand piston, um, 2,000, 2,200 or whatever else, we'd start to see some inconsistencies in the piston shape uh, and its integrity would be compromised a little bit. It wouldn't fail, um, but you'd see little weak points. So what we did is we took what we had already learned and applied that to this piston design. Current piston that we're running is um, CP's uh, billet, what they call a turbo HD forging. Um, the advantages with um, CP is that they have dozens and dozens and dozens of different mold, already pre-moulded piston blanks. So then we, when we say, look, we want a particular skirt design, we want a particular uh, dome design, a particular ring pack and whatever else, the good thing with them is they'll go, okay, this is going to work for you. Uh, without having to sit there and machine the inside of the piston to try and get it to where it should be from some of the other manufacturers who, quite frankly, are probably limited on um, how many blanks they've got to work with. So I've gone, okay, well, I need this piston to do this. I want this compression ratio. I want my, my dome uh, designed to be like this. I want gas porting on the side. I want to run particular uh, rings. I want to run a two and a half inch pin, which for me, is pivotal. Um, the two and a half inch wide pin gives it a much wider surface area uh, on, the, on the piston, so it, it grabs over a uh, wider area. It means more even distribution on the piston itself, where we're able to actually apply a fair bit of material in the top end, which is one of the things we were seeing with some of the other pistons. They weren't failing, but under extreme duress, you'd get a piston back and you'd see a slight dip in the, in the middle. Okay, so that slight dip in the middle means that all that force from that cylinder pushing right down the middle of the, of the piston would eventually compromise the, the, the dome of it. To get a strong piston, it's a compromise between design and weight. We've already proven that the weight of what we're using with, with the alloy rod and the bearing and whatever else in a steel rod combination works happily all day, every day, street, drag, whatever, with our combo. Um, we're saving a massive amount of weight so we can afford to put a little bit more weight and strength into this piston so we don't have any issues compromising around the skirt, um, around the, the, the piston pin area, and especially on the dome, which is where we found some of the other brands had a slight issue with, uh, with slight indentation. Another thing that we found with the, um, the CP piston is we we're able to um, if we needed to make any small changes to the wear pattern of the, the skirt, um, it's quite easy to do with a CNC machine. Once we run these pistons in our engines, we can then see what the wear pattern's like on the skirt. If we feel we need to make any small changes from batch to batch, uh, it's simply just a matter of uh, talking with the engineers at CP. 
Um, we can then tell them, look, we found that the contact area is really good, but we'd like to stretch it a little bit more. They'll make a small change on the program and then off we go, the next batch will come out and it'll be as per whatever we want. We want to increase it, decrease it, it's pretty simple. The next thing that we found as well, there's some very, very light grooves in the, in the skirt of the piston. That actually is pretty beneficial because um, it actually helps hold uh, oil, which help, aids in the lubrication of the piston skirt. A bit like what the um, crosshatch pattern will do in a ball. The piston design inside, um, the HD turbo forging, uh, is significantly different than your base off the shelf uh, CP and a few of the other manufacturers' pistons. One of the big differences is a lot of emphasis on the gudgeon pin boss area. Um, by that I mean it's quite chunky and solid, the way it should be when you're trying to make 500 horsepower per cylinder. We're able to um, maintain the integrity of the piston inside and not have to go and machine it and change the design of it. Um, one, because um, CP's got dozens of different forging, so once we decide on a piston design, we'll then see what sort of piston skirt thickness we want, uh, we'll see what sort of dome thickness we want, and then they'll come up with a, um, a piston uh, forging that'll best suit what we're doing. Pretty well spot on. A couple of advantages in doing it this particular way, and that is that because it's all cast and forged in place, you've got much smoother curves, you've got much smoother transition between angles. There's only so much you can do with machining inside there with a, with a CNC machine. You're not always gonna be able to get perfectly smooth transition between the boss, boss ends on the, on the gudgeon pin and, the, and the, the, the skirt to the um, actual, the top of the piston dome. So by, le by having that particular design there the way it is, it's a lot smoother transition and we have found that in some cases, some of the pistons which have been machined inside, will start to have a little, where, where they've got little sharp edges, uh, they'll start to have little cracks and, and whatnot in those areas. So by doing it the way we're doing it here, we know that that's the right way to do it. Across the area here, what the HD turbo forging does is by bringing that hole closer together, it's really strengthening the skirt area and that's where you want to focus on with the piston as well. Apart from having a, a really strong dome and on the top of the piston where everything happens. Now there's one last thing which I did want to cover. Some manufacturers out there will gang tool some of the piston. So in other words, what happens is they'll go in with uh, three, three or four different tools and they'll go and do one cut on the piston ring grooves. Uh, that has been shown to be a quick way of doing things, but not so beneficial in the whole overall design of the piston. Uh, CP doesn't do it that way. They do one tool, one cut, one tool, one cut, one tool, one cut. We're very specific with that because we want to make sure we have a rigid surface and 100% sealing on the, on the bottom of the top ring. So um, I can assure you that that is um, specifically done that way through CP. So we do have a 100% straight finish all the way through. Gas porting is um, something that's been around for quite some time um, in how we do it. Um, and like your sport compact cars and stuff, is we're putting the gas ports on the side. So basically what happens is you get all the cylinder pressure coming down around the top of the piston. Some of it will go around the side of the piston and it will go to the top of the piston, but then the gas ports will allow the pressure to go in the top of the piston ring um, and then in behind it and actually help hold the piston ring out for maximum sealing. What that does is that allows you to, to make more horsepower with less blow-by. That's, that's obviously beneficial in itself. The thing that we do as well is we use a PVD top ring. That particular coated ring has been proven to be super beneficial in sealing the piston to ring to bore. Again, that's horsepower. The, the less blow-by we can have in an engine to a certain extent, the more we can seal it into the top, the more power we're going to make. And there's, there's all sorts of things about minimising ring flutter and, and whatnot, at, especially at like 11,500 RPM. In a nutshell, you don't need gas porting on a street combo. Why? Because you want to maximise the life of it. Um, what have we done to make it seal better anyway from previous? We've introduced the CP with some goodies off this particular combo and also the PVD rings. That helps sealing dramatically. We've had to go a step further with this because this is all about power. 
Uh, they're, they're obviously, you've got to have reliability, but it's all about getting down to the end of the strip. It's not a circuit extreme, it's a drag extreme kit. So, um, so yeah, so we've been able to pass some of the, the things across from what we've known now onto our street combo. That's things that filter down from the top end motorsport to a street setup. Uh, obviously, the, the shape of the your dome doesn't need to be as aggressive as this is. So we've made some small changes, uh, and obviously the, the weight difference is a little bit different because we're using steel rods. Um, but there's no issue on compromise being proven already.